Oh, the question is what one word describes your DevOps implementation? Yep, you got it. Oh, is this you know, the live stream is on live? Yeah. Can you uh make sure I get your best side? Can you stay on that side? This side? Yeah. Over oh, the presentation? Yeah. Primarily, you can move around. We could slide the whole thing over. That would be choice. Uh, I, I, I don't really like standing on that podium. Yeah. So just stick to the right. We got all kinds of time, all kinds of time, guys. But if you if you want to go ahead and participate in the first poll, the question is, what one word describes your DevOps implementation? You can text your answer. If you go to text SFPNC to 22333, and it'll prompt you to give that one word. Oh, it flips the earth? Yeah, it, it, it looks like it in this, but it actually, it corrects it. Oh, it does? I believe so. Oh, because it's supposed to be, oh yeah, that way it's not confusing yeah. to see yourself. Yeah. Gotcha. What are you going to write your presentation? How about the transition from an 800-pound gorilla Just stay up there. And if you're the podium, it's not the worst thing. Right there, you're perfect. Right there, you're even better. Everywhere? Everywhere. You see, right there, you're perfect. Even more perfect, or. No, it's it. If you're just coming in, we have a live poll. I'm going to do a few of these in the presentation. So the probably the Wi-Fi connection here is easiest way. I'm not sure I'm bottom of my talk about that. It's probably your handle or not. Sexy. Come on, 
distributions to the left? Well, so this is actually, it's not a projector, but it's actually a oh. okay. I don't think we're really too much of yeah. I think someone thought I was asking about the immigration status. Amy says so we're sounding good. Sorry? Amy says we're sounding good. Oh, she did. She went. Great. So this is actually the last record to the world. Great. So good. So see you. Thanks for talking, man. If uh, if you're just coming in, uh, we're going to do some polling today, and we have one going live right now. Um, if you text SFPNC to two two three three three, the one word that describes your DevOps implementation is the question that we prompt you with. So we take SFPNC to 2233.
Does it show you that uh, one? So there's one person. Put out on social media there. So. We can say we did it. And I'm gonna report it too. So it will report on channel. So we're getting some pretty good answers on uh, our poll so far. We've got a few more minutes before we get started. Um, we're doing a going to do several polls. So keep your phones out uh, if you don't mind. This first one is what one word describes the DevOps implementation in your organization. And so you can get started by texting SFPNC to two two three three three. And if you keep that thread open, um, as I throw more questions out, you can answer the questions. What's the disclaimer about if, if your plan may charge you 30 cents or something? So someone's clearly upvoting and undocumented. The way this works is things that keep getting put up get bigger. So it's a good thing to answer. I think I'm good. You'd like to. Just a shirt. Sorry? Just a shirt. Yeah, just a shirt. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, hey, I'm Patrick nice Harry. Nice That's Pete. He's doing a Facebook Live. Uh, no, it's not a YouTube, YouTube Live. live. It's it's YouTube live stream. Yes, you're out to, the, out to the world right now. <laughs> just walk across. The, walk across the leg. Introduce yourself. Welcome to SFA. <laughs> So if you just came in, you're wondering what's going on up there, we're uh, going to be doing several polls today. This is the first one. Um, if you text SFPNC to 22333, um, you'll get a prompt where you can enter the one word that describes DevOps implementation in your organization. Right now, uh, undocumented was trending a couple of minutes ago, and now we're looking more like uh, ongoing scattered, unsupported, so somebody's out there doing it on their own, rolling their own in their box, that's cool. Um, Inventor, success, disorder, success, oh yeah, that's what I call bullshit on, who's, who's <laughs> who, who said success, who will put their hand up, so Gina, she said, that was, that was a success, I'm going, yeah, so you guys feeling like these words are Probably describing a lot of you, a lot of your process so far. Incomplete, solitary. So somebody's out there trying to do it on their own. Probably in a large organization. Hot. Oh, hot mess. Sleepy. Those are good. No curse words yet. You should not get some uh, profanity up there. Sultry. Oh, so who said, who said sultry? I gotta know what that even means. 
DevOps? What is the sultry DevOps? I want to work there. Effective, that's good. Lacking vision. So, um, hopefully, I'm going to help you out with that a little bit today because I'll be talking more about vision than necessarily about tools. If you're here trying to learn about tools, you might be a little disappointed. I'll learn a little bit about that, not much. So, is that how it's pronounced? To the tour drain, Rue Goldberg esque. The start. So, where to start? I'm going to talk about that, so that's cool. So, you guys are me up. Um, black box. So, a lot of good uh, imaginary. That's good. So, somebody just has no idea what's going on. Uh, so, these are all, and, and by the way, I give this presentation a lot of times, and, and it's, um, it's very rare that someone is. Puts up something like success, unless you're just playing with me. Um, so I'll preface by saying this is a challenge for all of us. Um, we've been going down our box path for I don't know three, four years, something like that. We're still we still feel like in some ways we're just getting started, um, but but that's cool. And so good thing is is if you felt alone in your struggles, don't worry. Um, hopefully I can I can help out with some of that. Um, so. Uh, First off, I'm Patrick Turner. Uh, I'm with Small Footprint. We're based up in Winston-Salem, so we have a pretty good crew down here that drove down uh, this morning, about an hour and a half away. If you've never heard of Winston, and we're a software development services business. And so we provide end-to-end -end software development services. If you were in Michael Goff's presentation earlier today, he was talking about agile planning. So we do a lot of consulting, helping organizations um, adopt and better use agile in organizations. And so one of the things I focus on is helping organizations with their DevOps practice. Um, I've been building software professionally for about 25 years. Um, so I started at a very young age. And uh, 15 years of that in, in, small, in corporate America, the last 10 or so, uh, working with small footprint where I'm the CTO. So we've all heard before I worked on my machine. Um, and the reality is 80% of projects fail, right, because of that. And it's generally because of poor communications between the developers, between the QA, operations, God forbid anybody actually talk to the, the business process owner. And ultimately, we run into issues where the QA team has really no idea what to test, where to test it, how to test it. They don't get told anything to the last minute. Same thing with operations. They get to find out on Friday morning that they get to do a big deployment on Saturday night. Have fun, guys. Everyone else leaves and says, feel free to order yourself some pizza. But it's generally, um, you know, developers throwing stuff over the wall and just hoping that QA can figure out what they're supposed to be testing and operations can figure out what they're supposed to actually be deploying. Um, but really, at the end of the day, um, what DevOps should really be about is getting everybody rowing in the same direction. And so what my goal has always been is to build great software. And that's ultimately everything that we're, probably you guys are all here, right? Because your goal is to build great software. And we have all these processes and things around that. And Agile, of course, has really helped teach the team how to work better together. Fundamentally, that's the key for me, is it gets the key people actually talking to each other so that you can actually deliver good software. And the way I look at DevOps is DevOps is just extending that same improved communication and collaboration throughout the organization. And so for me, again, you see the Agile cycles there? All I do is throw DevOps in there further down the chain. And it's, it's facilitating the communication and collaboration all the way down through the delivery team. Um, of course, DevOps being a good buzzword means that everyone thinks it means different things. So I decided to take a stab at actually writing a definition. Um, and I probably change this a little bit every time I present. But really, the way we see it is DevOps is integrating and automating processes. It's creating transparency so that people can build the best possible software. And this is my definition. If yours is a little different, that's okay. If it's a lot different, we should talk after. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is get everybody talking to each other to build better software. Um, so we're going to start again. I told you guys we're going to have a lot of polls. And so what I want to find out next is what is your biggest challenge with implementing DevOps? And so this is what I have to do is picture a letter for this. Uh, so is it education? Already coming out there, culture. So, whoever said culture, thank you. You're setting me up for a good presentation. 
time, which is always a challenge in any software development organization. Um, interestingly, nobody's answered tools yet. That's usually a big winner because people don't even know where to start with the tools. Thank you, whoever I'm talking to you now. And, uh, and, and no plan. So look at this. So culture is, uh, is pretty much coming there. I'll give you guys a few more, few more seconds here. And one of the one of the things hopefully I'm going to do today is give you guys some ways to maybe impact the culture a little bit to, uh, to help with that process. So clearly, culture is a big winner. Um, education is a challenge. As I said, we don't even necessarily know how to best um, uh, be able to define what DevOps is, much less figure out how to use the tools and get everything set up and have all that thing going on. So again. The problem with traditional processes is that it creates silos. You have development over there who probably isn't really talking to the business to find out what needs to happen. Agile is helping with that. Um, they're certainly not talking to operations, like I said earlier, that they love to just throw the, the, the code over the wall. And by the way, my background is software engineering, so if I pick on software engineers, I'll pick on myself. So I'm not offending anyone. Um, as I mentioned before, you have this QA team, and they're probably sitting in another building. They have no idea what builds are coming at them, what they should be looking at in those builds, or even where they can go to find that build to be able to test it. And of course, operations has no clue what's coming. And so what DevOps is going to do for you if you've implemented those people so that they can better work together. So again, you notice I haven't really talked about tools yet, right? Because this is all about having tools in place to help facilitate that, uh, that communication process. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process. And um, but before that, I, I was asking at lunch today, trying to figure out the gauge the audience. So I don't know how many of you guys are technical, how many of you even know what I'm talking about if I say something like unit test. So we're going to do a, a quick survey here and see how honest you guys are. This is one where people always lie. Um, so text me your answer. How mature are your unit testing practices? And don't worry, this is an important question, but I'm going to tell you why in just a second. So we're just getting started. What's unit testing? That's so okay, that's good. I didn't know if I needed to answer that question. I'll give you guys a, a short definition of unit testing in a second. We've got decent coverage. That is okay. So that's fantastic. 49% of you have decent coverage. <clears throat> no, well, okay. A few people are at are saying 100 percent coverage, which by the way, in, in my book, if you have 100 percent coverage, it's because your project started two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, it, it's invariably, if you're dealing with anything legacy, which most of us probably are, right? There's no unit tests out there. So, uh, so I, this is, I think, I don't know if this is a, a, if this is really indicative of what's really going on out there, but 50% of you say we've got decent coverage. That's fantastic. But for the 8% of you who said you don't know what unit testing is, um, the, the short answer for unit testing is that unit testing is code that's testing code. So if you have a function that's an addition function, you pass one and one into the unit test, you want to get two out. If you don't, something wrong with the code. So the real key with it though is that which we'll talk about in just a minute, you gotta have good unit test coverage. Because otherwise there's just really no point. So you can spin up Jenkins or whatever your CI tool of, of choice is, and without good unit tests, you're really not gonna have anything to do a build to have anything fail to really see what's happening. So that's really important. And again, uh, so since that is code testing code, that means that the developers are actually taking some responsibility for quality. <laughs> Say that again, developers are taking responsibility for quality. Like that's crazy shit, right? But it's important <laughs> because back in the day, and I'm guilty too, right? Oh, I got I got to get this done by this afternoon. I finished my code. I threw it over the wall. Maybe there's a VA or a QA or somebody looking at it. Maybe it's the end user back in the day. Crap, it broke. I had no idea because I hadn't even done basic unit testing. So it's this is immediately a culture shift because now all of a sudden you have developers taking on this new role where they actually have some responsibility for testing the quality of the code. And by the way, if there's good unit test coverage, you guys, 50% of you that said you had good unit test coverage, when that build fails because the unit test fails, it's going to say, Joe over there in the corner, has a problem. It's great. We, we you know, test being built. We love to play that. Who's, who wrote the build today, right? But again, it's a, it's a huge culture shift because we're no longer just throwing code over the wall. Um, by the way, we've been shooting for about an 80% coverage uh, with, with unit testing so far. It sounds like some of you guys have, have better than that. But we are, like most of you, probably dealing with some legacy applications that come back and putting in unit testing sort of after the fact. Um, 
Really though, ultimately, it also was able to demonstrate for us when we got started that we had some challenges being tested. So sometimes that meant that um, the code just really couldn't handle it. So you have this big monolithic application that does 14,000 different things in one chunk of code. It's pretty hard to write a unit test on, on top of that. But trying to, to getting started, you start to realize that. And of course, developers also talk about time being a challenge and just even understanding how to write the unit test is a big challenge. Um, but ultimately, that's it's just really important that, that goes. And so what this does is it gets us started in this engine now where we're actually doing this whole process of development. And so the unit test, as I said, is really critical that you have that in place because without the good unit test in place, when you go to do that commit, you get that build out there, it's not really going to tell you a whole heck of a lot. By the way, our, our developers at this point are starting to embrace unit tests. Not all of them, but a lot of them, and certainly we do have some projects with 100% coverage. Real key here, though, and I didn't say I was going to talk about the culture, um, the, the challenge for us was just getting started. And so what we did in our organization is we had a little contest. And all we did was, was a few years ago, we just said, everybody in the organization, all the developers, all you have to do is write one unit test. And we're going to throw your name in the hat and give away an iPad. Pretty simple, right? And what that did for us is, first off, it made some people realize, okay, unit tests aren't really that complicated. It's doable. It also pointed out some other issues, like I mentioned before, that there could be architectural issues that keep us from being able to write good unit tests. But ultimately, it gets you going down that path. And the key with unit tests is just getting started. So anyway, that little, little contest was a good way to go, and it really made a huge difference. So next thing I'm going to talk about is source code management. And you're probably thinking, how the heck is the entire source code management culture? But what we found is when we implemented distributed source code management, which most of us just call it Git, right? This is the FedEx of source code management these days. Um, it really changed the way we looked at things and how we worked together. So um, when I started developing, I think there was really, I didn't, I'd never heard of anything like source code management. So it was pretty cool, I think, in the 90s when we were like, oh, we're going to have a centralized repository. We can all check in. So we had this master code branch. And sort of the way you were doing check-ins back then is that your work was on your machine, and you're ready to put it into place. You stuck it out there in this master branch. So, of course, what happened was it came time to go live, and everyone went, everyone went oh, shit, what's supposed to go live? Everything's in there. We have to quickly comment out the stuff that shouldn't be going live and figure out, okay, what if the QA the QA's tested it or the BAs or does it seem to be tested and eventually just go screw it. We're just going to put it out there in the future time. Terrible, right? It's a horrible way to go. Um, so then, then we got clever and we said, all right, let's have a development branch. And we're going to go out here and instead of everybody who wishes for the development branch, I mean, so, I'm sorry, the master branch, we're going to put it over here in this development branch. And that was great because now not everybody was just throwing their source code into the master, but we still had all the same problems. We still ended up with finger pointing. And so Susie over here pushes something live because she has some code that's ready to go. Meanwhile, Joe's stuff wasn't quite ready yet, but he didn't bother to tell anybody. But the same problems, right? We're putting bad code now just is collected from development over into this master branch. We still have the same issues. So then along came Git. Is everybody here familiar with Git? You've at least heard of it. It's not the southern way people say Git. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided, all right, we're pretty cool. We're going to use Git like all the other cool dev shops. And we installed it. It's great. We started moving everything. We happen to be on TFS. So we're moving over to Git. It's all great. And it was like, crap, we just have the same problems that we shifted it over to. That's why my screen was like. Right. Interesting. Uh, so, the key with Git for us and for your organization should be that you don't just install it and migrate your code over and assume that it's all as well. In this case, you really have to think about what you're doing. Because when you're using Git, well, your teams are self organizing, sounds very agile, right? Into these feature branches where you can do collective, whether a feature branch is a user story or an epic or just a collection of teams or one team. It doesn't really matter what, in my opinion, what your approach is, as long as you're thinking about how you're going to actually organize your community, the feature branches. And this is really important. And so we literally had some of our team managers who were like, well, we're going to get 
all good. We don't want to think about it. We're just going to keep working. And lo and behold, it was just like back in the 90s. We might as well just all work in the same master branch because we were still throwing stuff out there to a bill that wasn't quite ready for prime time. So the real key is, is, is use these feature branches. Think about how your team's going to be organized and what you'll end up with is, is cleaner bills. Certainly, at the end of the day, let's make a point, right? Joe, as you know, you wrote the bill, you wrote the bill, or you put the crappy wood up in the production. My favorite part about this, though, by the way, is the bug fix piece, um, because we all love bug fix. But the great part about this as well is because you have all of your the code that's working process separated out here into these feature branches, now if you have some bug arise out in production, you can safely pull that chunk of code out, fix it, put it back in the master branch without worrying about what Joe and Susie are working over here in these feature branches. Does that make sense? But again, some of you are probably going, well, yeah, of course. But I can tell you that a lot of developers are going to just rush into using these tools without thinking about how they're going to organize themselves, organize this their code into these feature branches. So the real key here, and this is my next culture hack, is that whenever developers are working in a single branch, it's going to create problems. They're going to end up pointing fingers at each other. Just because you implemented Git doesn't solve your problems. You really need to take the time to come up with a good strategy. It may just be at the beginning of the project, it may be during every sprint planning, you know, it doesn't, you really have to figure out what makes the most sense for your organization. But the real key is, is that these tools, if used properly with good strategy, are going to change your culture. It's going to get the developers to play nice with each other. It's going to get better builds out into the production. At the end of the day, we're all going to be much happy, happier campers with a much better culture. So, um, and by the way, if anybody has any questions as I'm zipping through this, feel free to jump out there. So, uh, do we have any QAs in the room? Cool, all right. Good news is you're going to like this section. <laughs> QAs always, because people are like, wait a minute, come on, DevOps, I don't even have QAs. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, DevOps has really changed the QA more than anyone else in the organization. Um, and ultimately, DevOps is going to enable automation. Uh, and enabling new feature testing to be more predominant, performance testing to be more part of the standard process. And really, those the, the machine is going to change the way that all works. Um, this is the part where sometimes I do offend the QA, but, but back when I got started, my screen. back when I got started, um, the QA was probably somebody in customer service who was really good at breaking the app, and they were always finding problems. And you say, hey, Bill, over in customer service, you need to be in QA. And essentially, all the bill was doing was manual testing. He was just banging on it, just looking for stuff to happen. We call it, we have a fancy name for that now, smoke testing. Back in the day, that's all we did for testing was this manual process. So um, really, what we've got with DevOps now is it's given us the ability to create automated tests so that the machine is now actually doing that. We now need to write test scripts so that we're actually looking at those user stories building test scripts around those user stories so that we actually know what we're supposed to be testing instead of just the developer saying, oh, by the way, I changed that button from red to blue. Now we actually really understand it. Um, as well as I mentioned before, we can do a lot more things like performance testing and security testing all through that process, eliminating that. So the real key here is that now we've taken that automation and instead of uh, instead of just the QA job being that grunt work, being that smoke testing, now, we have the machine that's processing all of those um, tests that the, that the QA test automation has written so that the QA can really focus on adding more value. And in our organization, what that's, what's happened is, is that we've um, trained our QAs, we've hired people in with those skill sets. Um, now, our QAs are adding a lot more value to the overall process. And by the way, one of the main things that we find that they have time to do presentation and testing is actually talking to the product owner, to the product managers, and actually to the user. So really the key here is that DevOps can have a huge impact on your QA organization. So traditionally it's this manual tedious process, but now thanks to uh, the miracle that is that automation, QAs can really focus on adding more value. And another great example that we've done is we actually have QAs who are focused on things like user experience testing, which is this whole new world Back in the day when all we were doing was you know spending all of our time doing smoke testing, 
now we can actually uh, specialize and find more ways to add value to uh, to the process. I told you you'd like to break these fragments because this stuff. So, um, of course, when, when most people think about DevOps, they really think about the ops. Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about uh, user experience uh, um, testing and uh, uh, so automation versus, uh, so that is still a manual process but you're going through the experience? Yeah, so so my key there is really that because of, of being able to write automated tests, because of unit tests that are stopping a lot of the bugs before they hit the build, um, and because we have the machine doing things like performance testing, pen testing, that sort of thing, what it really enables is it enables the QAs to focus more on is that a good feature that we just built? So not just is the thing breaking, but is this something that's actually valuable that the end user can actually easily use? So my short answer to your question is, is no, I don't know a whole lot about user experience testing, but the key from my perspective is, is that we're letting the machine do more of the grunt work so that the QA can really focus on helping us deliver great software beyond just not building software. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So there's a transition from just doing small testing to doing automated testing on all containers. Does that also change the composition of the QA team? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I was waiting for that question because it gets asked every time. Yeah, and so it was, it was a real challenge for us. And like most organizations, you know, typically QAs, um, and most of our QAs have computer engineering and computer science degrees. But even after that, they got into QA because they didn't tell really want to be a heads down coder. And of course, we've done a whole lot to try to automate the automation. So we've built frameworks, and of course, now there's a lot of open source frameworks that you can use. But what we found was not all of our QA testers wanted to become QA automation engineers, and that was cool. And so, yeah, it ended up with this specialization where, I'd say, 75 80% of our QAs. Or at least willing to get in and do a little bit of that. Some others really focused more on writing good test scripts, which could either be you know done uh, manually or through the machine by someone else. But it really did change it from sort of this one role in the organization to multiple QA roles in the organization. And, and by the way, just to add on that a little bit, yeah, we knew we really wanted to go back and have as good coverage as we could, not only on unit testing but on automation testing. So we had to recruit both to help us pick up on the backlog. But also, we had to recruit some of the skills that we didn't have. Sure. How do you make that transition? I think it really depends on how your organization looks today. So, if your QA team today is largely people that were end users that were good at breaking the machine with no technical background, um, you're probably going to have to recruit some, some people. Now, I don't know if that means that you move those other people into other roles, you know, like I said, the whole philosophical debate there. But yeah, I think it, it depends upon how sophisticated your organization is, what your current QA team looks like. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, 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 for us, it did change. Our QA team grew. Um, we have a pretty good ratio of, of, you know, so for a team of four or five developers, we have at least one QA. So it really raises your QA. But quite frankly, I think, all of these things like unit testing and all this is going to change the whole the, all of that job, right? It's going to change the whole way you work. It's going to make it more efficient and a lot different than the way it used to look. Any other questions before I move on? So, um, all right. So as I mentioned, generally when we're talking about DevOps, people think about, um, about uh, deployment. Sorry, this is going on. But, Again, the key is, is that with continuous integration, um, we're going to end up with clean builds. And so this whole process becomes something that happens on a regular basis. And by the way, you'll notice, I don't know if was anybody was paying attention to the left side of this chart, um, traditionally, deploy only really being between test and ops, if you want to think about those three big circles. But the, the nice thing about this as well is that when you're thinking about your deployment pipeline, don't forget that now you're going to be doing between development and test as well. You know, by the way, once you mature, then your, your QA team is actually going to know where that build is and, of course, know what's in that build, et cetera, et cetera. And these automated deployments are going to be providing all of that for you. But again, when you do that automated build, you check in the code, it's going to automatically run those unit tests, integration tests, automated tests, and deploy it. 
to whichever stage you're in the process. And, uh, and then again, because these things are all happening automatically, um, it's one less thing that your team has to necessarily worry about. So again, the real key here is that um, with, with automated deployments or continuous deployments and continuous integration, this is going to solve a lot of the problems team generally has. I said at the very beginning, that classic issue of, well, it worked on my machine is going to go away. And I, I don't know if you guys ever heard the joke when the developer says it worked on my machine, that's when you ship the developer's laptop to the end user. Uh, yeah, so it's going to fix that problem. And the key with continuous integration, continuous delivery, it's going to ensure those deployments um, are, have the high visibility that they need and, and increased transparency. So again, I, I even look at this CI CD pipeline thing as a way to change your culture because once again, it's getting everybody aware of what's going on in the process and eliminating a lot of the finger point that goes on. So um, from my perspective, really, when we look at this, the, the biggest change that, uh, that we have in our organization has been the use of containers and infrastructure as code, as well as more enhanced monitoring and orchestration of that code. And so the real key here is that um, back in the day, the developer, the developer would say, okay, I need uh, Java version X, and I need that to run on Linux to this operating system. And it was the sort of thing where maybe it was well documented, maybe it wasn't, and sometimes the developer would say, most of the time, the developer didn't even realize what versions of all these things she had on her machine, and so it was this crazy thing. And so uh, then they would throw that code over to the operations team and say, deploy it, and then of course it would work. And so back we could go to, well, work my machine, that's same classic problem. And so what, what really DevOps has created is this new cultural situation where the developers and the operations team actually have to talk to each other from the very beginning. Right? It's crazy. But for us to be able to do this, if we're going to use infrastructure with code, and our team actually have to be um, And then nobody knows the same on the developer's machine, and the environment, the same production, because that's used everywhere. It's going to be based on infrastructure code. And so now it's become this just highly scripted, really easy to understand environment. By the way, my, my favorite part about this now is this is not all of our projects, but I'm going to lie to you. But we have a lot of our projects now where when we bring on a new developer, instead of back in the day where you spend a week setting up in your environment, all you have to do is deploy a container on your app, on your device, and you're good to go with that new project. But what this really, really does is is that means that we can do really cool recovery from, from failures that happen in the system. We can do really nice things like feature switching, where we can have this, where we have, we only want to show it to a few people with orchestration and containers and infrastructure easy to do. And then in this canary staging, where you put a few, just a few of those different instances out there, if you have a problem, the bird dies, right? And so it does all these sorts of things. So I don't want to get too much into these details. But again, the real is that now all of a sudden, instead of just the developer throwing that code over the wall to operations and saying, have fun, enjoy your pizza, I'll see you on Monday. Now they work together, they know what to expect. Everything is scripted out. We know exactly what the container is supposed to look like, what my desktop screen looks like. We're going to know exactly what's going to happen. So that when those deployments happen, there's no surprises. And, and what you find is that now all of a sudden, you might want to call your DevOps team instead of your sysadmin team. That way they feel like they're doing something more. But ultimately, they're actually getting to collaborate the same way now that our product owners and product managers are working with the developers and QAs in the agile process. Now DevOps means that we're getting to pull in those operations guys as well. So everybody's ready to go. So um, really, the just a few words on monitoring. Uh, um, the, the real key and the way we look at monitoring is not like, okay, we can hide behind this and have the user know what, you know, not know that anything ever happened, which is really cool if you can do that good. But the key is, is that we, we've really taken monitoring to a new level where we're actually trying to make sure that 
We are proactively telling the user what's going on right, instead of waiting for them to call. Call us and tell us. But we're also using a lot of new tools to ensure that we're they're actually able to identify those problems. We're doing things row level and um, but ultimately, what our goal is is not necessarily to to cover, but it's to make sure that every problems. So that whether you have a dashboard that your end users can actually see learning, um, see see what's happening, so that we're proactively telling people this is a problem, this is what we're doing about it. And again, this can be built into your deployment pipeline through things like orchestration and monitoring tools to help you really avoid having a very find out the development team. Still, hours after the users are starting to call customer service. And what you really want to do is make sure that you're doing proactive monitoring in a number of different ways to ensure that finding these issues before the user finds them, and, and even better yet, telling them what's going on as it happens. And ultimately, what we want to do is get everybody rolling. That's, that's really the issue. Okay, so one more survey. Which is, what do you hope to achieve with DevOps? It's already in there, your phone. So, happier teams, faster, more frequent delivery, higher quality releases, better communication collaboration, higher employee engagement. Yeah, and invariably B and C are always the winners here because, of course, ultimately what we're trying to do is get great software into our users' hands faster. Um, we can't all be Facebook putting out new versions every, every 30 seconds. That can be a um, And the interesting thing will actually have answers about your teams. I did have your team, so thank you whoever said that. That's, that's really nice to see. Um, and so it, it's, really, it's really the key there. And I think this is great to see again that you guys certainly share the same values we do, which is we want to get great software in our users' hands as quickly as for this um, high quality as possible. So again, you know, a lot of people want to talk about DevOps and spend a whole lot of time talking about the tools. Certainly, if you have any questions about tools, I could be happy to talk to you about that otherwise. But the culture. And so whether that means you have to change your culture or you have to actually make your sysadmin sit down. With your engineering team to figure out how they're going to architect that infrastructure, um, or whether it means that you, you are bringing people in the room that you wouldn't normally bring into. But the key is getting your entire team to collaborate together better, ensuring transparency so that the QA knows what's coming down the pipe, the sysadmin knows what's going to be deployed this week, and that the software engineers actually take this responsibility for quality is really. Uh, um, is really the key to uh, to DevOps. So again, we're really all about getting everybody talking together and actually having those three silos um, come together and break those silos down. So um, again, my name is uh, Patrick Turner, and um, I will say this: as I mentioned at the beginning, we're certainly still finding challenges. We're still certainly addressing those. Um, we've written a lot about our challenges. You can, if you want to feel the pain along with us. Should check out our blog at smallfootprint.com. Um, we're also on Twitter at SPNC, and I'm on Twitter too. Over there, you probably see me tweet from the conference today, T U R N E P F. Um, but again, we've certainly taken our lumps, and, um, and that's that's the real key to this. But what we have found ultimately is that the tools were really easy to implement, but meanwhile, the culture was the real challenge, and that's what made the difference for us on DevOps approach. Thanks very much. Well, I mean, a container is really about building a small machine that, that has just what that machine uses. So if you have other something to, you don't necessarily want to bundle the entire monolithic application into a single container. But each of those containers can essentially be running machines that are using that other service.
Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I'll tell you, I feel like most of what we do today is dealing with someone else's API, and, um, and it continues to be a challenge. But from our perspective, a good service contract is the way to go with good sample data. Now, people love to break service contracts, and, and one of our biggest challenges along those lines is that uh, a good service track, a good service contract for an API is going to mean that there's versioning for that. Um, that tends to be the thing that people, that's the rule people like to break. Is the versioning rule, but if the, those same APIs are being written against contracts with good versioning, and of course the versioning of that is all reliant upon a good DevOps process for the service itself, that should solve the problem. We still have that issue though, and that's and as long as as long as there's disparate development team working in different parts of the building or the planet or whatever, we're going to have that challenge. But I think service contract up front so that we can make sure that people at least know the rules of the game whether they're going to play them or not. Any other questions? Yeah. What advice would you have um, for someone who's having trouble, I don't know, like encouraging automation or maybe a process? Do you know what I mean? I think ultimately, conversation about quality. Any other questions? <laughs> 